So we were still in the basement in 70. Yeah. And um, this guy used to, he, all denim, had a, a, a ah, can't remember his name, <laughs> and a bag, and kind of hippie and long hair, and walked barefoot around Port of Spain, you know. So <laughs> when the shooting started, he said, you know, I can take all the marches and the protestation and so on, but shooting I can't take. <laughs> Got out of here, man. Which, but he did, he did point us to some things which no director had told us yet. You know, we were doing the balcony and yeah, we were re reading it and so on, you know. And I said, Jay Ranelli is his name. Yes. I said, Jay, wh where do I go? They're coming to see you, not me. So where do you want to go? <laughs> you know? I mean, that was unheard <laughs> in Trinidad before working with local directors. Direct, direct, tell you what to do, what to do, you know what I mean? But you didn't know you had, you didn't know you had choice as an actor. At least to show the director, well, I feel like going here and, and let him say, no, don't do that or do it later, you know. So we learned something from Jay Ranelli anyway, you know, and which I think made, was a revolution for us because Derek couldn't, um, you know, come up against us again, saying, raise your hand this way. <laughs> Hold your hand. I don't want to raise my hand that way. I raise it this way, you know. We used to mess with him, you know, <laughs> because Derek was always with this gesture, the gesture and Everything had to be just as he envisaged it in his painting of watercolors and so on, you know. He was one for, for Toulouse Lautrec, you know, like parting and so on, that kind of gesture. Remember when we did, um, um, no, the one in, in Queen's Hall uh, that became last carnival. Uh, Find a fine castle. Find a fine castle. And it was a whole lot of photographs that, I mean, you see, now I have no problem with that, eh, that posturing your, blocking your scenes according to paintings, you know. But to take an actor and get them in the postures that you, that you take from, I said that's a bit much. That, that, that's a bit much. That leads into a question. Yeah. And that is, what does the actor bring? To rehearsal. To rehearsal? To rehearsal. What does the actor you read the script? Yes? Yeah. And what, what do you bring to the rehearsal? What 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 happens to you when you read the script? Well, you're talking about in a vacuum here, right? About just any play. You have to remember how we work how we work with Derek a lot is that the plays were usually written for Errol Jones, Stanley Marshall, myself, uh, you know, when I say four, with them in mind, you know, um, so that when we came to read, <laughs> when we came to read a play, the play was familiar to us already. He used to bring um, sides, if you like, scenes for us to read and go through and things. Um, Steel was, was done over 20 years, you know. I remember with me playing... Um, was the man name? Growler. Not Growler. Wilbert was playing Growler. <laughs> when I said playing, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. workshop. And I was doing, I remember, I, 1969, 1960, what the freaking year. I had this hand in a, a cast because I had cut off this finger. You know, so I remember the year. I remember. So, <laughs> I remember having the hand in, on the table and I was doing the tent manager. Right. Yeah, which, um, Martino. Martino, yes. Okay. Yeah. And Wilbert and I did some very magical Wilbert things. Holder. Eh? Wilbert Holder. Wilbert Holder. He used to talk about this theater magic. Magical things would happen, that we do things that no director could direct. 
nor you could even discuss and say, we're going to do this. But it just happens out of some kind of kinetic something going on in stage. And we do it. And you could never repeat it. <laughs> because it lived only at that time, you know. You shouldn't even try. You don't even try. I mean, if you try, it's, yeah, it's bad. And this, especially with Wilbert, this happened to me and him about three times. In rehearsals, in performances, and so on. You know, but I, I'm saying that you ask what I bring to the thing, I bring my intellect, <laughs> right? <laughs> what I bring, I have tools. I'm getting specific though in terms of preparation because what I find with, with a lot of young actors is that they don't realize that preparation is a process and there is such a thing as preparation. And I know you're big on preparation. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's yes, the yes, only yes. thing. There is a, when, when, no, whether, whether it's you finding your own personal preparation or you following some system of preparation, yeah. that preparation You know, I, I'd say it might sound like heresy, but I would say that Derek has never directed me. He always took what I brought. I mean, and it's a fact. I, I'm sure he will tell you that himself if he has the, you know, the honesty to say so. I don't remember... The most that he would say is, um, I make, no, no, don't make that cross there. Make that cross a little lower down here because of something. You know, you know what I mean? The yeah, the picture, the picture. You know? But about the content of the, of the role, I had worked 10 years in San Fernando by being directed and being directed. So I know that you had to learn your lines. <laughs> and when I came up here, Derek said, um, Spencer Tracy always said, if you want to be an actor, learn your lines. Spencer Tracy or anybody. If you want to be an actor, you learn your lines. I mean, you get there. <laughs> when, <laughs> anyway, I'll come to that. But when you get there, half the work is done. You know, instead of walking around with a book, walking around with a book, everybody walking around with a book, and you feel, and we come next week and you do, and you learn your lines. And this is amateurish hobbyism that I have no time for. I left a long time ago. And the actors that we work with here, we encourage them in the same vein. You know? Learn your lines. The director will take care of the rest. Or the photographer, the camera. You know? But learn your lines. If you're doing a film, learn your lines. Know your lines. When, when I, The first time I got, I worked in America, not yet, but um, we did. Um, I was talking about 62 when, oh no, when I joined Workshop and when the, the thing came. Um, and Workshop, it was true Workshop that you got to America, right? Uh, it's true Workshop that you got to America. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to Derek. <laughs> yeah. Um, we worked in the basement. And remember, we up to the 70, from about 64 till about 70. Uh, one or two, we were in the basement. Don't board. <laughs> good catch, good catch. <laughs> um, what happened was that we were doing Tijan. Tijan, that's my big thing. That was very central to my whole career and so on. And we did it in, in Town Hall, City Hall, down in, in here. And then we did it in, in Jamaica, and we did it in Grenada, and we did it all over the islands and so forth. And then, um, 72, Derek was asked to um, stage it at NYU. New York University Art School for the Arts. So he he did it with the actors there, the student actors. Now the school NYU is just a walk in the sense from the public theater, Joseph Papp's New York Shakespeare Festival. So what they do when they have um, student productions, they invite all the producers that they can find to come in and look at what is happening. Because NYU trains people for 
the professional, for the, for the, for the industry. So they expose them to agents and all kinds of things. The, yeah, what is it called? Um, uh, in, in my C, the, the New York State Art uh, um, Commission for the State Arts, for the Arts, and there's another one, DEA something for the Arts, you know. Um, they came, they, 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 they always come. So when Joseph Papp, who is the most important um, person in theater in, 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 um, in New York, in America at the time, he came and he saw it and he invited. He, he is, his remit is to re, he get state support for staging Shakespeare freely to the public in the, the um, Central Park. The Delacorte is the theater is called, our open air theater. So he asked Derek if he would present a contemporary piece that is in, 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 in the Delacorte. And Derek said, yeah, sure, sure, sure. It will be the first time that he's doing a kind of non-Shakespeare thing. You know. And then after there, it will be toured over the boroughs of uh, America. So Derek said, yes, except he wants he want certain things. He wants nobody else but Albert Lovo to play the devil. And Joseph Papp said, sure, sure, sure. Wait, anybody else? Anybody? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to have Hamill Paris to play the, the frog. That's Paris. Conrad, Conrad, Conrad Paris. He said, and I want Andrew Bedou to do the music. Yeah, right, right. Everybody, everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think, and he wanted Andre, Andre Tanker to play the music. And um, Andre Bedou, the drummer. He's a folk drummer and singer, you know. So this little contingent, about five of us, went over there. And um, <laughs> I won't say the rest is history. Sorry, I don't like to say that. Um, we performed there to mixed, mixed reviews. But they were all unanimous in praise of the Trinidad contingent, you know. One writer whose name Peter something in the Simon. new, eh? Simon. Simon, Simon, I think so. Yeah. Um, they were in praise of the principal actor. But there was another guy who was in, he was in with New York Times. And um, he really panned it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So Derek said, as we, I told Derek about this re review that I said, he said, uh, did you, did you, um, what's his name? And I told him the name. He said, oh, I remember that guy. He said, I met him at some cocktail or something. And he told me that he's a writer. He's a critic. And I asked, he said, he asked him, um, okay, so you're a critic. Um, where, what do you write? He said, criticisms. That's what I do. He said, I, I did my degree in criticism. And Derek said, that he really, Stone and tell you Americans or something else. You don't write anything, but you go and you have a degree in criticizing other people's work. Who the, the hard blood and sweat, you know. So the guy got back at him <laughs> in the review. Boy, he really was nasty, you know. Um, said uh, well, things was like that, tinsley and window dressing and all kinds of things. You know? Anyway. After that, um, Joseph Papp told, came to me, or saw, saw me, and told me. After, we, we were there whole summer, August into September, and then we toured the boroughs, Brooklyn, uh, uptown, um, you know, Harlem, and so on. And he said to me that um, if you ever thought of being professional, this would be a chance because he's never seen anybody come in here on the first show in New York and get the kind of reviews that you've got, you know, the reaction, and not only the written reviews, but the word around, you know? So I thought about it and I called my chairman who gave, who had given me three months paid leave to go and do this and come back and he told me if, if, if it doesn't work out. I spoke with him and he said, 
you have no choice but to go this way because the rest of your life would be spent in wondering what could have happened and what could have, what have and maybe it'll be miserable, who knows, you know? You say, we don't want to be miserable. You say, you go and if it doesn't work out, come back, you got a job in the factory, you know? So I went. I, 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 I came back home after, because you have to get your papers from down here, you know, your visa and so on. I resigned my job, got my $10,000 paid for my land. My wife started building the house and I went off to New York to do um, cherry, cherry orchard. And I got there and found, even I didn't get there yet, when I was about to leave, Get waiting to, for, to hear that my visa is ready. Joe Pop calls and said that the, the, the Division of Labor would not give me a license to come a work permit. This is a work permit, you know. I had already resigned my job. This is it. Tiger is being ridden. <laughs> and you know what Tagore says who rides the tiger, there's not this mount, you know. So I said, uh-uh, I'm coming to New York, <laughs> you know. Um, they kicked up quite a fuss because the role wasn't large enough to require importing and after. This was unions. This is a country that has an industry, that have unions, that have laws and everything. So take note when you get your industry in Trinidad, you know. I mean, that's what an industry is. It has codes and, you know, <laughs> behaviors and all kinds of things. We don't have an industry here. We have activity. We have, you know, some behaviorism. kind of behaviorism, you know. Um, but it will take people to say, this is my job, you know. So I went back and I walked into Joe's office and everybody had long faces, all the secretaries, because the whole thing. You know, you think all you could gossip? <laughs> Talk about New York. <laughs> Everybody knew what was going on with me, having to quit my job, and Joe encouraged me to come back and know it. I said, don't worry about it, people. It's going to be all right. I promise you, it's going to be okay. And everybody perked up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I'm the hero still because of that visit to the office. Because they were all down and you know, do, and the poor man and his wife and child. And it's a worry. You know. um, if somebody tell you that they don't like you <laughs> when you're small, <laughs> you can grow the rest of your life saying nobody don't like me. Nah, you make everybody like you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what you do. You know, so everybody liked me. <laughs> I sound like my grandson. My little grandson, he's 12 years old. Everybody likes me. Everybody likes me. He's complaining that everybody likes me. I said, hey, <laughs> you, should, you should thank your lucky stars that you weren't told when I was your age <laughs> what I was told. But we won't go into that. <laughs> you know? So um, Joe said, okay, we have a lot of stuff for you. I, I, what I did, I got a six-month visa, okay? So what you do is you six-month visa, you go, and if you're working, you get a letter, and you go and you get an extension, and you got a six-month, you know? So Joe put me in the casting department, one. I'll tell you about the casting department. And the one that I liked a lot, he sent me to Broadway to go look at the place because um. Producers from out of town would bring plays and want him to put it on his list, you know. But he doesn't have the time to look at everything, you know. So he has, as they have this new um, element in, in government, advisors, you know. So I just, advisors or consultants. So I just go get some ticket, go see the play, come back, maybe carry a friend, you know, or two. <laughs> And we talk about it, and I go back and give him my opinion, and he would decide whether to take it. Or... Usually, if I like a play, he would say that play is not going to make it. So people like you and me, <laughs> they don't 
like our taste and, in and body, you know. So he said, um, so I learned to develop what was commercial, you know, to develop the app, the, the, the eye for what was a, could be a commercial hit, you know. Things with music. They like New York likes music. Yeah. Uh, and on that vein, what happened to you and James Earl Jones? He told me to go down in the basement and James was doing cherry orchard. And you see, I wanted to look in and see, I have Jimmy Jones doing this. Go and look. <laughs> and, um, and come back and talk to me. So I went down. I must say that I still have the lasting impression that James Earl Jones is a very boring man. Right? <laughs> so when he started talking, we sat sitting down, he and I sitting and talking, and he started telling me about this thing, and I fell asleep while he was talking because I had a hard night. But anyway, I went down and to see what he was doing, and he was talking about taking the... He said that the, his opinion was that the Russians have the same vitality like black people. I said, hello. <laughs> black people. This is a play about white people. Uh, about everything that made them who they are, white Russians, you know. And, and, and coming face, facing the... the, and the entry yes, and facing the demise of that kind of like cherry or that kind of thing. So he had these people doing all kind of, hey, I'm going to tell you, nigger, or some kind of thing like that, kind of nigger thing, you know? <laughs> so I told you, I told, I told, um, I told you what my impressions were that, you know? So he said, okay, I'll take, I'll go down there and take a look, you know? <laughs> so he went down and took a look and fired him, <laughs> you know? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> That was a job. It's a job. It's a job. You know? <laughs> yeah? No, I mean, he's a big hero star and all that kind of thing, but I'm talking about don't mess around with classics. You know, a classic is a classic. You, I mean, yeah, you could take something like, um, like, 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 like um, Romeo and Juliet and make it into a, a West Side Story. Yeah? You know, you could. Try to that. But don't gut the whole Russian ethos and so on in the interest of doing something for black people. You know? <laughs> anyway, that was the story about me and James. But we, be, we became good friends because I, I met him later on when I was at NYU and he come over and so on, you know. And, uh, <laughs> 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 Um, well, this was after I'd come back. After I'd be tour. We toured in the River Niger. I was cast. Can I go there and then come there? Yeah. Yes. We, we, I was cast as the doctor who was the, the friend of the principal actor. Uh, and this, this, was a, this guy was a West Indian doctor. And this guy is a, the, the, the principal character in the play is a house painter and stuff and he wants to be a poet he writes poetry he, writes, he wrote this long poet about the river Niger hear my waters you know he read this long poem and um, his wife is dying from cancer and I'm the doctor who's treating her and he has a grandmother and a son who is running with the gangs out there. So it's a few elements that you could put together in a safe drama. And um, a man named Gordon Brown was playing the role. He was from somewhere down by Geechee country, where that is, you know, and um, near Atlanta somewhere there. But he, he had to drop out. He did it on Broadway, but he couldn't make the tour. So they got me, uh, honest to goodness, West Indian. He's supposed to be Jamaican. The first day, 
when I did a, a read for them, and I do my Jamaican accent, they said, no, 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 just do your normal accent. <laughs> that was too extreme. <laughs> so I just did me, you know. And we, we got good reviews all over the place. We, 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 worked, we started in Philadelphia, we were in Baltimore, we were in Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, is Missouri is the only place we spent two weeks. Everywhere else we spent three or four weeks. Then we went to Hollywood for two months, Huntington and Vine, and Vine, you know, at the, at the Huntington at, on Vine Street. We spent two months there and had lots of fantastic experiences. Then we came back. We, we, we retraced our steps and we went to some of these cities again for two weeks and so on. And 400 performances in one year. I tell you, 400 performances. I'm telling you, we never missed a week. We traveled on a Monday, which is dark, and the set went... And then when we got there, we went and looked at the theater, and then we started Tuesday again to Sunday, two on Wednesday, two on Saturday, and eight performances every week. That's, now I say, this is work, this is a job, this is a profession. I want to share this with my people in Trinidad. I just, I kept saying all the time, I would like them, it would, it would lift them if they could just have some little in. Inclination to, you know, kind of thing. This is the invention of this problem. Eh? Yeah. But we did, we did manage to do a run here, you know, with 35 performances of beef, no chicken, right? Seven weeks. Five performances every week. That's the nearest we got to, to, to uh, <laughs> 500, 400, 50 weeks, two weeks off, you know. I even got a raise of pay. Do anything, you know, you just want a whole year. Um, at the end of that, that would have been 1974. Uh, 74? 75. 74. There was a war. There was a war in the Middle East. I think it was called the Seven Days War. But it didn't just end. What we didn't know, what I didn't know, what a lot of people don't know, is that it's just Jewish money that runs the theaters in America, and still do. It's their money that, you know, finances um, Broadway and all the major theaters. And what happened that year, they just taken out the money and sent it to, to the, the war effort there. And it seemed like the next year is going to be grim, because when we were touring, I saw already that we were the only live theater in the cities that we were playing, playing even in Hollywood. No, there was, a, there was another musical thing happening downtown. Um, but it was much. And actors were in, in droves un, un, unemployed all over the place. I mean, when, we, when they had to open for us at the, at the theater, a whole lot of actors came, you know, they had switch lights and all that kind of thing outside the theater, you know, and um, parties going on, and after the show, I don't want to call people names, but there's some very important people, guy like, you know, Ben Vereen, you know, dancer, guy comes up to me, one of our actors, he said, guess who hit me for five bucks, <laughs> Ben Vereen. Want to pay the cab to go home. <laughs> these guys use some kind of credit card to get these big limousines to bring them, you know, and they got photographed stepping out and so on, you know. But going home, oh, I forgot my wallet. You know? You're hearing that all over the place. I personally didn't extend any money, but these guys, the American guys, were astonished. And they were calling some names, they said, gee, where is it? I mean, there were big people there, you know. And we, we got to go to parties with, at Lonnie Elder's house with people like um, Cicely Tyson, you know, and um, uh, the other, the other, the other Calypsonian, uh, Pryor, Richard Pryor, 
Kat Rasul ni Kat Rasul Comedian Yeah So it was It was It was You know Living the life You know So what What you're saying Is the whole That whole theatre scene Basically collapsed Well they told me At the beginning In New York That That 92% Of the Unionized actors Are permanently Out of work Said 92% so last year I, I told I was talking to a guy, an, an actor who was with us, Neville Richard, if things have changed. He said, Yeah, things have changed. No longer ninety two percent, but ninety five percent. Now, it does not mean that you cannot be an actor professionally. But you have to make your own work. You have to get your, your actors together. Rent a place, put your plate on. You know, and you could you you could find that you're getting um, uh, equity recognition for, for this sort of thing. So I encourage a lot of actors in New York to do that. And they, they were Joe, Joe Papp said, "Okay, we will give him give him a tear and so on." So I came home for Christmas or something, and when I went back to New York, I'm going and and I drive to New York, and I see a billboard. My name <laughs> in it featuring Albert Lavo. <laughs> so, I, there was a Jamaican guy, Basil something, that I were kind of mentoring about getting his show on and how to do the play. He was doing a, 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 one of um, the Smintias or something play, that guy. Edgar, Edgar's play? Edgar, Edgar White? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was saying, directed, featuring or directed by Albert Lavoe. Put my name. Say, hey, I've arrived. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you get that kind of phonyism sometimes. Eh? People use your name just because they think they could get some advantage, you know? Um, it's a dangerous scene for men and women, it's very sexist. <laughs> Scenario. You've heard about the casting culture. You know?